Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another session of DWP. My name is Kevin, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Tonight's session is part two of the Devolution series. Our topic for tonight will be the rationali rationalizing the role of central government in devolution. We have a special guest joining us tonight, Dr. Mungai Lene, who will be presenting on the topic. Dr. Lene is a senior policy advisor who focuses on leadership development and policy dialogue. He is a former World Bank country manager to Zimbabwe and a former senior social protection specialist at the World Bank in Washington, DC. He also has many years experience in planning, project, develop, project design, institutional development. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Mungai Lene, our speaker for tonight. Welcome, Doc. After Dr. Linnae's presentation, we will open up the floor for questions and contributions. Please use the hand reaction emoji if you wish to contribute or ask any question. Thank you. Over to you, Doc. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin, and good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to come back to have this conversation with all of you, uh, dialogue with the prof. And uh, I hope uh, tonight will be an interesting, uh, lively discussion of some of the issues that I think the topic uh, demands of us to, uh, to try and understand. My presentation, I'll be sharing it. Um, if I, my technology allows me to, I think you can see it. Uh, if you can't see it, let me know. Uh, Kevin, you can be seen, yeah? Kevin, the, the, it's visible. Yes, we can see it, definitely. Thank you. Great. Now, if, if for those who might want to, um, uh, to follow the presentation on, on your computers, uh, I've put in the, um, a link to the document. I put in my, my there was, the, the, was the, the chat box, uh, the link to the document that we prepared in 20, uh, 20 after provincial dialogues on devolution around the country. So it, it's a much bigger document. Uh, I'm, I'm only going to talk to the, the bit that I contributed to the devolution uh, session then and borrowing a little bit from the document to try and make sure that the, um, the, the, the talk is, is interesting and people can raise questions that are relevant to the subject they're interested in. I was asked to talk about the rationalizing, rationalizing the role of central government in devolution, and obviously the appropriate mandates and capacity of subnational government. In that document you have, there's a very interesting presentation made by Dr. Chatika, I can't remember, I have to remember his name, how to pronounce it, uh, on the role of the subnational government, the role of uh, subnational government and their mandates. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the detail, but at least in the context of rationalization of central government, I will touch on the main issues that uh, Dr. Uh, that presentation goes into detail to. For me, the theme of this rationalization, and it, it was the theme I, I used in 2019, 2020, is, is, is making the principle of subsidiarity work. And, and that is really is what underpins the, the, the presentation. Their presentation goal comes in four parts. The first two parts really is, is trying to put together the building blocks for uh, devolution. And the second two parts trying to kind of quickly, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. Most of my time will be spent in the first two parts, and I'll quickly go through the second two parts so then we can have a chance to have a discussion uh, on the issues raised. So the first two parts are the, really the main building blocks. And uh, the idea is to at least make sure we have at least a common shared knowledge of what devolution means and or what it doesn't mean. Um, and they are, this is not a science, it's, 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 it's based out of practice over the years as political science, political economy uh, brought together to make sure at least the body of knowledge talking about uh, the idea of decentralization and devolution as a subset of decentralization is understood. So 
I will do the overview of decentralization, then the key principles of subsidiarity, that not everything can be devolved or should be devolved. Then I will talk about fiscal governance because it's so important in terms of uh, the way devolution and government work to deliver services to the people, which is why people are devol devolution. And finally, I'll talk about the local economic development model and how, what it might mean in the case of Zimbabwe. Then after that, I'll quickly go through the 10 parameters for effective devolution. I'll quickly run through them. Then devolution or challenge, the sharing the resources, which ultimately is why uh, citizens want uh, decentralization, devolution. The sharing of power is really ultimately is about how we share the resources, not just power, but the resources. That is the cover of the booklet. Uh, it's called Devolution Dialogue, Celebrating Devolution, 10 Governments, One Nation. And the theme was that the Zimbabwe government, when we were doing this devolution, we started off with the private sector and, and a couple of non-governmental institutions. And the government, by the second devolution, the government came on board full throttle and were able to bring in various political parties, citizens, yes, you know, private sector. And, and the main theme was that the Zimbabwe, the, the, the state, the, the, the constitution provides for a vote state that has got 10 provinces, but a one nation. And therefore the idea is how do you create um, a, a one nation that is devolved? And I think one of the things I think they were, the, the message you are trying to send in the earlier discussion of devolution, this was seen as something that people from one part of the country, mainly Matibili land, were arguing that they want a devolution. And therefore, there was, it, it's almost like there was almost a, an attempt to equate devolution to secession. And there are two different issues. So the question was, and I think that the theme the government was trying to push forward, and we, we kind of debated it at length, was that Zimbabwe is a unitary state, but it will, be, it will have devolved power to allow citizens to interact with their leaders and to be able to relate to various elements of social development, socioeconomic development and politics as well um, uh, within the context of this idea of 10 governments, one nation. And, and then the Zimbabwe had 10 provinces, uh, 92 local authorities, and that is really makes 100 and I think one or two uh, you know, kind of units of uh, governance in Zimbabwe uh, that, that we have. Uh, let me say something about decentralization. It's really, it's about two things. It's about where decision makers are located and who are they accountable to. So decision makers can be located at the center or at the periphery. You can either be located in London or located in Johannesburg or Harare or Nairobi or Lagos or, or, or Dubai or in the case of India, Bombay or New Delhi. Then, and the, therefore that is the fundamental, that's one of the, on the, on the, on the, on the, the x-axis. Where are decision makers located? Are they at the center or are they on the outside or the periphery? Who are they, how is accountability, where is the accountability to be found? Is it, and, and therefore the accountability is high accountability to low accountability. And, and therefore, the question is, if you look at the first quadrant, which is privatization, this is where the, the decision makers are located at the center and uh, accountability is also at the center. Uh, therefore, is the highest level, you know, it's, 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 and therefore the British South African company is an example and the private and state-owned corporations are examples whereby the decision makers uh, are located uh, at the center and the, the accountability is to the periphery, is to the, uh, sorry, and the accountability is also centralized. Therefore, uh, if you look at that um, uh, privatization, the British government at the turn at the end of the colonial, at the end of the, at the beginning of the colonial empire, decided to license basically private companies to run states. And these guys were responsible to themselves. They ran, they were come to themselves. 
they ran the state the way they wanted. And in the case of South Africa, for instance, the case of Zimbabwe, then called Rhodesia, they could either operate from Cape Town, uh, the miners who come out here. And they have very little uh, recourse to the center. They were more or less left to do what they wanted. And, and, and that, it's, 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 it's an interesting model because it is the earliest form of kind of when the state starts kind of coming together. They start there and, 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 and therefore they let the, their, their rulers, kind of the people they, they work with, you know, kind of who look after their interests, more or less leave them to themselves. They're almost like feudal lords. And, and, and company, private companies are very similar to that. This, you know, if you are buying beer or buying uh, produce from a company and you go to a, their shop that sells in Blauai or, or Chipinge and there's a problem, it is unlikely they're going to tell you call Harare or call Blauai or, or Mutare where the headquarters is, is committed to complain about the service we are giving you. Therefore, the people sitting on the ground, they are there. They are, they, the power is centralized, but they are devolved. They are sitting at the, out there and they make the decisions themselves. And therefore, that is the, the, uh, uh, the idea of that in privatization, you are out there, you are on your own, uh, and the center, you have a very limited relationship with the center because the center quite often doesn't have the means or the capacities or the abilities or to be too expensive to exercise the kind of power that is required in the other three forms of uh, decentralization. So privatization is the easiest one in the sense everyone is left to their own devices and there's very little recourse to centers and, and the people at the local level, they decide what they do. But there's a center, which is occasionally, if you upset it long enough, they will come after you. And in the case of British South Africa company, and there was East India, East, East African company, there was, there was a West Indies company, there was one in, in, in East India. They all ran themselves to the ground when the people who are being ruled felt, you know, the conflict got in sufficiently large and the local, rulers didn't have the means to exercise the kind of authority that the, 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 the Commonwealth, the, the colonial office was demanding of them. That is the privatization. The next one is centralization. Here, the colonial administration, you, you locate the, 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 the decision makers at the center, and you also look, you, but you locate the accountability to the periphery. So uh, the colonial office makes a decision uh, the governor uh, makes is, is more or less very rarely do they have to go back to headquarters, but they are still accountable, and they are given authority to to make decisions and force a decision from the center. But there is a slightly more control oversight from the center as opposed to privatization, and and therefore is one step uh, away from privatization. That was mainly the colonial model administration. Is, is, it's, it's a little bit more expensive than privatization because you then have to you know, locate military forces out there. You have to put garrisons uh, you have to have a police force, but you also allow them to be at least to be accountable at the periphery, at the, at, you know, down at the periphery. Then you got the concentration. And this is the, the most, the commonest form of governance across the world. Uh, it is deconcentration in the sense that the state is centralized, then they take their own employees and locate them to the periphery. So you are a civil servant, and you are located to uh, Gweru, to, to, to Motorashanga, but you are accountable to the center. Therefore, your accountability to the center, just like, uh, and the, the, uh, and, and that's the, the deconcentration. And, and in, in fact, in Zimbabwe, this happened in uh, the Prime Minister's Directive of 1985, which, um, which, which was issued to try and create the provincial development councils, the district development councils, and a kind of a very loose form of the World Development Committees and Village Development Committees. But basically, the, the center remained very firmly in control. 
but the, the decision makers were at the periphery. They were outside the center. They were not in Harare. They were out in, in the province. Now we come to the devolution. And here, I think I will use two examples. One is the pre-colonial uh, uh, system where the people of uh, Mashonda land sat down in Darius uh, or, the, the, or the, they sat in Kotla in Botswana or they sat in Davos in South Africa. The decision makers and, and, and their accountability was right there. And that was probably one of them. And that's one of the in communal societies, you can say they are probably the most devolved in the sense that those who exercise power, they right there with the people and they are accountable to the people at, the, at, the, at that level. Then you have the 2013 constitution of Zimbabwe, which tries articulates a position whereby they want uh, uh, devolution. So that is the, the theory of it. Now, there are four quadrants of it, as I said, uh, centralization, the Rhodesia colony, privatization, reconcentration, decision makers at the periphery come to the center. Decision makers at the center come to the periphery at the beginning. And decision makers at the periphery are accountable in the periphery. And that really is where I want us to spend our time. The rest of it was just to, to, to make sure that we all understand that devolution is just one form of decentralization. This is the Zimbabwe constitution. And the Zimbabwe constitution is based on, 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 on a principle that has evolved in the last 300 years, I think. Could be older, but I think generally in the last 300 years with the rise of industrialization, there was the idea that you should separate the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. That is, those three arms of state should be able to exist to check on each other. And in centralized, whether in a centralized system or not, or decentralized or deconcentrated, those they try and maintain those three in the argument that the days of the king who had executive, legislative with their, like King Arthur and his, uh, he sat in the council and then he has executive and they could also pass judgment and have you executed. Those days were gone. And the, the idea is that you create a system whereby the executive is separate from the legislative, is separate from judiciary. In the case of Zimbabwe, this is what they have put in the constitution. The executive has three levels. The centralized, which is also the president cabinet and minister of local government, those who are really, in terms of constitutional responsibilities, those are the kind of the centralized one. And the cabinet has other ministers. The minister of local government was singled out because they are the one who administer the Rural District Councils Act and the Urban Councils Act. So they, they, they are seen as central important pieces of the center in terms of exercising power. Then you have the province, which is deconcentrated structure, the provincial minister of state and civil servants. The idea is that the people who are sitting in the province as minister of state, he is answerable to the president. He is not answerable to the people in the province. The civil servants in the province are answerable to the center. They are civil servants employed by the central government. The devolved one was the idea is that the council or local authority is where power would be exercised. And in the constitution, there are really two centers of power. The centralized, where the, the officer, the president, cabinet, and minister of local government is, and the local authorities. Then there are two coordinating structures. One is the province, provincial council, and the other one is a district. Those two structures as, as the province as we know them, they do not have a, 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 any executive authority. They are coordination structure that makes sure the local authorities can be coordinated and um, at the district level and the provincial level. Uh, but that only applies to eight provinces. Two provinces, the metropolitans, have got the same executive authority as the other provincial, where there's going to be councils that are indirectly elected. I don't think there's any direct elections from what I recall from constitution, but I could be wrong. We'd have to check that again. It's, it's, it's two, three years, it's two years since I, I presented this in 2019. But basically, the main thing is to remember there are three levels of government. Um, and, and, and actually, there is, let's just see what did I do with it. Uh, there's something wrong with my, I need to get rid of this bar, which is kind of covering my, what I'm, what is at the bottom? 
So that is, uh, that's the default function of, of government. Then, then the legislative, those are easy. There is parliament, there is provincial and metropolitan councils, and they have the same, in the case of the provincial minister of state and civil servants, they mainly operate in the, in, in the sense of deconcentration in the, eight, in the eight provinces. The other two provinces, the metropolitan, they have the same authority in terms of political importance and oversight as a council, the council staff, and they really should have they are meant to be provincial and metropolitan councils, local authorities, and chiefs. Then you got the courts, and those ones you have the centralized courts, the deconcentrated courts that are in the provinces. Now, further down, there are magistrates, but the magistrates really form almost like a continuum, continuum of the, of the provincial. Uh, they are not really seen as a kind of that. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the power that is separate, too separate from the province. The important thing here I want to draw out uh, is that the chiefs have a special uh, role. The chiefs are the only institution in this country that combines the executive, legislative, and judicial. The chief has executive authority. He can convene a court. They can oversee what happens in, the very, in, the, in their areas they can even lock you up. So the chiefs are the only people in this country who have got the three, that's where the three of them converge. Everywhere else, those three arms of state are supposed to be kept separate. This is the main agenda that came out of that devolution. And I wanna go through it because it is the framework within which we, we, we try to understand how do you define the role of a central government in a devolved state? And there are eight functions. One is the resource allocation formula. We all know about the 5% that goes to the provinces, to the, to the devolved system. And that money is not sent to the province to distribute to local authorities. That money is sent directly to each local authority, all 92 of them. And a small budget is sent to the province for coordination. So the resources go straight from treasury, not to the ministry of local government, not to the province, directly to local authority, that is responsible for that money and is their responsibility to decide how to spend it with some guidance from the center. But it is not a function that, and, and there that's a difference between South Africa and Zimbabwe, for instance. In South Africa, the South African government treasury sends the money to the province and the province sends the money to the uh, districts, to the lower levels, the local authorities. And they, when the Zimbabweans went to see the South African, the constitution makers decided that the bottlenecks in resource flow is so, so serious in South Africa, they did not want to go that route. So they decided that the money will go from treasury, any devolution money meant for given to local authorities will go straight from the treasury to the local authority and the province will get its, 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 its own budget for coordination. Then the second function is finance and budgeting. This is a particularly important one because a lot of local authorities don't have the capacities, therefore they need to be supported. And the Ministry of Finance, they normally a budget office in Parliament has one, the Ministry of Finance has one, there's public financial management systems. That's a very important function for devolution because if you devolve money and the system don't exist and the money is misused and therefore doesn't deliver the services, then the Ministry of Finance by constitution can take it back because you have failed to live with the rules that were agreed in the constitution. Because every time the Ministry of Finance passes a budget, Parliament accepts it, it becomes law. The third one is procurement. And this is important because it allows a local authority to, to determine how they acquire services and goods for development in their local authority devolved unit. Fourthly is human resources development. Without that, you cannot have devolution. Human resources have to be employed at the devolved unit. Unfortunately, most of them are too weak. They have low revenue sources. So in the transition, it's understood that uh, there will be a stage process of shifting civil servants from the central government to the, to the local authorities, uh, except the ones to the province who remain part of the public service commission. The fifth one is governance and accountability. This is the one that really a lot of people are very interested in. It was, it was very hotly, hotly debated in the devolution sessions because people felt that you know, if you don't get that right, then the center will continue exercising power 
uh, and, and they require those systems to be very well articulated, understood, and put into practice. The sixth is doing business reforms. This is because if a local authority cannot de de develop its own uh, reforms to attract investment, first from its own citizens to invest in their own local authorities, secondly, from the neighboring uh, local authorities, thirdly, from the nation and eventually from region and international, then they will remain behind being developed. That everyone will want to come to Harare and Blauwe because that's where the most of the reforms when they are done, that's where they first get implemented. And because those two centers have so much more advantage than the others, doing business reforms need to be customized to each of the local authorities. And therefore the local authorities can, can at least formulate their own uh, uh, reforms. But the idea is that not to, uh, to, over, to, to, to go to the extent of they undermine their own efficiency and effectiveness. And that really is, is one of the things that we discuss quite a lot. Seventh, sector norms and standard. You cannot have a situation whereby uh, one local authority says a classroom of 20 children is 10 square meters. Another one says, ah, we don't have five meters, square meters. Another says, no, they can have 50 square meters. Central government has a responsibility to ensure that they are nationally agreed norms and standard that allow to make sure every citizen in Zimbabwe gets a service comparable to what the others are getting. Otherwise, then it means those who live in very poor local authorities then end up with a poorer work service than, than, than those who live in the wealthier one. And final one was natural resource sharing formula. This one was particularly exciting in a couple of the provinces that felt that natural resources are being exploited from their provinces. They are coming to the center and they, they are living, keeping holes in mines and living degraded uh, environment and they are not getting very much. Therefore, that was made an important dialogue. And these eight principles, these eight, this framework of eight is what we have continued to work with, with the Office of the President, Minister of Local Government, and the provisional ministers in terms of trying to figure how do you actually implement this in order the obstacles. The four principles, subsidiarity, very simple. Tasks should be performed at the lowest possible level in order to achieve greater efficiency, increase relevance, cost effectiveness, and sustainability. That is the reason why you are, my mother would ask me to, when friends came, visitors came, ask me, go and cut the chicken, kill it, because we have visitors. She didn't ask my father. That would know the principle of subsidiarity. My father shouldn't go around running after a chicken, and I'm there. When the relatives came and they needed to slaughter a goat, I wasn't just to be the one to go and slaughter a goat, I'm only a boy. So he and two or three older men then slaughtered the goat. When the village had a huge uh, uh, um, uh, event, festival, they needed to kill a cow, they brought many people from the village many men and, and young people in the village to actually make sure that is done. That is a principle of subsidiarity. You give people responsibilities in order to get to be efficient, to be relevant, to be cost effective, to be sustainable. Not everything can be dissolved. Defense, foreign affairs, and macro policies cannot be dissolved. You can't have a, the, the Manikaland a province a, a central bank or the Mani, the, the Matibili Land Minister of Defense or National Land West Minister of Foreign Affairs. So those remain national mandates. Then there are split mandates. And these happen because they have implications on the services and goods that people have. And examples are policing. You can't just have one centralized police system. In the US, which is pretty well developed in this area, they have a series of uh, police authority, police bodies that are created at different levels to respond to different sizes of geographical authority in terms of devolution. Taxation, the same. Uh, uh, and the Minister July Moore is very keen to remind local authorities their biggest source of revenue is taxation for the property tax rates. Then there are specialized service deliveries. Uh, if you live in an area where there's lots of uh, water, maybe you don't need a specialized service delivery. But really in an area where it's very dry, that might be a service delivery the local authority feels that they want to make sure they split between national level and province because it's, it's expensive. Like in the Kizomatibili land water project, 
it is not possible to leave it to one or two provinces. You have to split it between the pro those two provinces, Metropolitan Blauayo, uh, the province of uh, um, uh, Matabila North, and central government because that's a specialized service. Then there are the sub-national mandates. And these are the standard ones that tend to be, and they tend to be basic education, primary and secondary. Normally primary, that's the basic one. Health, water, infrastructure, and keeping of records. And these records have been really contentious issue because people feel that you shouldn't be coming to Harare to get your birth certificate. You should be able to actually get it from your local authority. And the ministry and the human and the ministry of um, the the one that does registration should be able to make sure that these services are available at every local authority and wherever possible. Now we have digitization; we can even devote further, almost like privatization. Physical governance. This is important because without it, we have we have problem. And the biggest problem is the second point: avoiding unfunded mandates. Devolution isn't about dumping authorities or dumping responsibilities to local authorities. And that's what tends to happen in the early stages of devolution. Central government has no money. They devolve and tell, well, we are giving you the responsibility of so what are you complaining about? Well, you were spending $10 per head uh, before you devolve. Now you give it to us, you don't even give us a dollar and you expect us to raise the money. Therefore, you are giving us unfunded mandates. And one of the principles of devolution is that every devolved system should refuse a, 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 a mandate that's unfunded. Tell the central government, keep it until you can, you can devolve the funds to us. Don't just give us the responsibility without the resources. The effective uh, fiscal oversight, public sound public financial management systems, and this is very important, a clarity in the lines of accountability. Who is accountable to who and for what? Between unfunded mandates and unclear accountability lines, most devolved systems fall apart on those two principles. This is the final block in terms of the big, the big, big bidding blocks of devolution. Local economic development. This, I think, is we called it the billing blocks for Zimbabwe middle income country 2030 and beyond. And there were three, really four points. One, Broaden local, broaden local production and markets. And uh, we have on this platform, Professor Mandirukun, who is extremely articulate on what that means and what the implications are. And he was the main speaker on that subject during the revolution. Second one is expand from local to national economy. And again, this is something Professor Mandirukun speaks very articulately about and he's on board. If he's asked, I will ask him to respond it because he was the man who was responding during the revolution. Thirdly, is spreading the benefits of economic growth. This is important. That is, there's no point having one province, one local authority is having all the economic benefits and the others don't. Just because Chiazua gold diamonds are produced in Manikala and doesn't mean Manikala should keep all the diamonds. They can keep some of them, but the rest of them should come to the center for redistribution to make sure that the country develops reasonably evenly. And you can also uh, favor those uh, local authorities that are uh, underserved or they have poor services. And really the final point is that the pathway to global presence, and this was the building local economic development, how to integrate markets from local to national to export. E.g., you take the cotton from Gokwe, you turn it into lint in Kadoma, you turn it in fabric in uh, the, 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 somewhere in Masasa, and you turn it into a dress somewhere in Chitungwiza or Borodil. And at each one of those points, you are creating jobs, you're increasing revenues, and therefore you are doing value addition. And that really should be the local economic development model for Zimbabwe going to, towards Vision 2030 and beyond so that uh, it's able to go from middle income country to upper, middle, upper income country. 10 parameters for effective devolution, reasons for devolution, political commitment, legal framework, effective judicial system, technical capacities, capacity buildings, creating high-performing devolved organizations, preventing elite capture. And uh, as I said, this is, uh, this I, have a, I, have a, I don't know how to get rid of it. Anyway, the, you can see it in the, in the presentation, um, effective system of citizen oversight and functioning something which I can't see because of the 
the, 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 the band that's hiding it. But you'll see it later on um, when I come to the, that point. A resource of devolution using local comparative advantages. If you've got timber, be good at making timber furniture. If you've got agricultural land, be the ones who grow the grain for the nation. If you've got excessive water, be the one who provides the water for the rest of the nation. You've got tourism like Vic Falls, make sure that the revenue you bring in there also is able to achieve it. That really is the reason for devolution is to kind of allowing each local authority to tap into its comparative advantage. Political commitment is the key is one of them is making devolution a national inclusive policy. It's not about breaking up the country to small states. It's about creating one nation uh, that is people feel they belong and they feel it serves their interest. Legal framework for transparency. One of the key questions here, and as I said, the presentation is available in the link I gave you, citizens access to these bodies. It is no point having devote systems if the citizens cannot access those bodies in the way they deliberate, the way they make decisions, and how they are held to account for those decisions they make. An effective judicial system. One of the big questions here in Zimbabwe is community dispute resolution system. And if you talk to Professor Mandrukun, he will tell you the great problem we are having with dispute resolution when it comes to land. So having this system at the traditional court systems and the district provincial court system, if you can, if that is made to work, then everyone feels that justice is served and served on time. The administrative and technical capacities, here the key is defining service delivery norms. What does it take? What does it produce? Who does it? And what should they be held accountable to in terms of delivering services? That's how you build one nation with many subsystems. Then capacity building is really making sure that the people who run these local authorities, the individuals and the institution, in this case, the officials employed by local, local authorities, the institution, the local authority themselves, and the people who live in that local authority can set objectives, they can achieve them, and they can solve their problems. That is the reason we devote it to solve problems that face the people. Therefore, the people themselves and the institution might be able to actually be able to, to set what objective, what do they want to do, how will they get it done, and what problem will they solve. Creating high performing developed organization. Allocation formula is useful to promote equity, not, not equality, equity. That is, if you uh, if you take the whole national budget divided equally among 10 provinces, Harare will get very little, but they have nearly 30% to 20% of the population. That's not equitable. It must be equal, but it's not equitable. Therefore, you have to find a way of formula that allows uh, equity to, to develop. You don't give uh, uh, all your children a dollar each. When one is a primary school, the other is in secondary school, the other is a university. You give them depending on what they need and therefore there's a certain level of equity that's available in the way that the resources are distributed. Eight, this is critical. Uh, avoiding elite capture. The big, one of the biggest problem, and you look at Latin America and Asia, and initially in the early stages of the US when they, they devolved, the local elite really did capture the, 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 they did capture the state, the, these devolved states. So structured engagement of local groups in governance and service delivery is critical because if the local groups are organized, therefore they tend to check the elite because the elite quite often want to be elected. They want their business people. They really don't want, don't want to upset, don't, don't want to upset the majority of the people who live in, in, the, in, the, in the devolved unit. But if there is no structured engagement, therefore they can do things in the dark and the people never know what is going on. Uh, systems for, uh, for citizens' oversight, uh, set up structures of participation. If, if there are no structures and you say, oh, you are free to participate, but there are no structures, then participation becomes a favor done to the people by somebody. While if the structures exist, there's an obligation for the people running the devolved institution to make those institutions bring in the people to participate in, 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 uh, in the citizens' oversight what goes on in a devolved state. And finally, anti-corruption bodies. The biggest message here is do not devolve corruption. If you have corruption in one center 
and you do not set up bodies to do the corruption, and you send it to 92 local authorities and 10 provinces, you will have 102 centers of corruption. So before you, you when you devolve things like procurement, in the various institutions, you need to make sure the anti-corruption bodies exist to make sure that corruption isn't devolved and multiply itself and becomes really becomes a cancer in society. And once it gets devolved, it will take generation to get rid of it. Think about all the countries who are listed as the most corrupt countries in the world, most of them are devolved. Uh, but once corruption takes place at the, grad, at the bottom institutions, they become self-fulfilling in the sense the institution don't want to give it up. And they start, because there are quite a lot of resources, this elite who are corrupt, they have a lot of power over small groups of people who then don't have the kind of mass, con, mass capability to be able to actually deal with, that, with the state. So it's important that this, this we consider one of the most important ones, is do not devolve corruption. Sharing resources, this I'll go very quickly, is an important one. It is the big one, and it's gonna be with us for a long time. Uh, the allocation formulas, you can read about them, population, geography, poverty levels, infrastructure, service deliveries. In the case of the current evolution by Zimbabwe, 10 5%, they decided there is such a big backlog of infrastructure. They have from the center said the 5% should be used for improving infrastructure. You can disagree, but that's what the center said. We give you the example of Kenya because it's one of the most recent uh, devolved system in, in Africa. It came after South Africa. They tried to learn from South Africa. They tried to learn from the US. Uh, and one of the things they avoided uh, in, 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 in South Africa, you elect the ANC. The ANC then decides the people who, you are, who are gonna represent you. So you might be directly elected to the party, but to the structure you go to, you are deployed by the party. Therefore. It's almost an element of democratic centralism. The, cent the party will decide and you follow, follow the decisions. So when the Kenyans came to look at their constitution, they decided, no, no, let's look at the American one. We like the American one, that the, the, the counties are directly elected, the governor of the county is directly elected, and therefore, he's answerable to the people. Um, two, we, we, we don't like the Westminster system, whereby a minister sits in parliament, he's a minister, he's executive, and he's also a constituency. Therefore, he's torn between looking at the interests of constituency, looking at the interests of executive, his boss, the prime minister, and also being a legislator. They like the American system whereby the two are kept separate. You're either in the Congress or the Senate or you're in President Biden or Donald Trump and his running mate or her, their running mate and you work for them and you are the executive and you are held accountable by local authority. In Zimbabwe, that was rejected. And that was rejected by both ZANU PF and MDC when they were discussing the, the constitution in 2013. Uh, South Africa and Nigeria are more flexible. Uh, they have very complex allocation formulae that transfers an enormous amount of money sometimes in theory, but quite often the money comes back to the treasury because the capacity to use it doesn't exist in the province and the province becomes a bottleneck. This is the sharing of formula against the county. We, the population, we, it takes a lot. Poverty index followed by basic equal sharing. The idea of what you call equalization fund is to make sure that the very poorest get a, a dis disproportionate amount of resources. Sometimes they are sparsely populated. They are very remote. They, are, they, are, they, they have very few resources. So giving them a nice block is always a good thing to help them catch up. 5% equalization fund, it gives you what they want to send it to. They mainly focus on what people need, which is water, roads, health facilities, and electricity, because quite often people who live in poorly served areas, that's what they really need and that's what they lack. Natural resources, uh, the, the reason for sharing is to avoid negative impacts, like people not look after the environment. Uh, quite often people feel they, they need to have some ownership of the resources. Uh, they allow the center and the periphery to have harmony. If Manika land is able to keep some resources from Chiazwa and Chiazwa local authority gets some resources, they generally are better harmonious relation between Chiazwa and Manika land and Manika land and Harare. So from that point of view, it does promote harmony and uh, it reduces the, poss the possibility of conflict. The Nigerian example in the East is very clear 
when they feel that the oil was being extracted from the East and nothing came back, uh, all sorts of uh, rebel movements, uh, conflict uh, arose in, in, in protest against that arrangement. Natural gas sharing is one very important one, and you can read about it, uh, why the, the natural resources are shared uh, in between, in, between devout state and the center and to create uh, a functional system. Uh, Indonesia, I give the petroleum example of Indonesia because Indonesia has a very interesting model. There is the national, there is the provincial type district, then what goes to each of them from their revenue, and then what goes to various districts in the province. So that it's not just the province producing diamonds or producing coal, but even the others do get a share of what is coming to the province. So you are you are promoting equity. Um, so that is more details on Indonesian model. Oil revenue, uh, we give this example to show the differences between uh, the countries that have, you look at some like Papua New Guinea, uh, central government takes a very large proportion of it. You look at something in Brazil uh, and the producing region gets a very large part of it. So each country, and you look at Mexico, um, there is a residual significant amount less to residual dis for distribution between all the regions. So each country, uh, Ghana and Nigeria have different models of it. Um, each country uses different models depending on the political economy and the socioeconomic development conditions of their own society. So it's not one formula fits all. Each country has to work on its own. Uh, that is the now, this is where I, I come to an end and, and really we left this question because we feel that people in the province, one of the big questions really natural resource, the resources sharing is gonna be critical and has driven devolution everywhere and power, power and resources. So we said, we left this question to the people in the provinces and we had a bit of discussion how will the national government share power with local governments in Zimbabwe? And here, uh, one of the things that came up was uh, the role of senators, members of parliament sitting in the provincial councils. And that was a compromise position in 2013. And it became an issue because it is very, uh, it's very poor accountability systems. It means that I'm, a, I'm an MP, I can sit in the local authority where my constituency is and I influence the way resources are allocated. I come to the province and I can do more further influence to make sure that what comes from my place goes further up. And therefore individuals' capabilities become more important than sometimes the needs of the people they represent. Then I come to the national level and I approve the budget. Then I go back to the province, the local authority oversees expenditure. Then write, they make sure I oversee the writing of the implementation report and come to the national level and say, this money was extremely well spent. It didn't sound like that was a particularly good form of accountability. So uh, one of the outcome of those devolution was that the constitution amendment should be done to make sure that the people in the provinces come from the provinces. The people who come from the members of parliament and senators should represent their constituents at the national level. They should not be able to actually have influence the way the resources are shared or used in the places they come from, just to come to the national parliament and actually pass it because they have a national responsibility. Will provincial local authorities the government have access to natural resources revenue in Zimbabwe? If yes, how will they share and be calculated? We left this question for them to ask because these are questions that kept coming up over and over again. Will the resource rich regions in Zimbabwe feel like they receive a fair share of the benefits? Chiazwa, Manikaland, this was a big debate. And uh, a fair share of the benefits from their natural resources extraction, will non-resource rich regions feel the same? That is, if Mutasa has no minerals, but they're in Manika land, will they feel that they're also getting a something out of Chiazwa diamonds? Although the majority of the diamonds will come to the center for redistribution, there should be some left in Manika land, some for Chiazwa, and some that helps the other provinces. Will there be enough transparency in the country uh, that the subnational governments can understand and predict the potential revenues coming to their area. This is important. I said power and resources lie at the heart of devolution. Final slide is what I really want to leave with you 
for me, summarize what I learned and, and uh, throughout the uh, devolution session in the provinces. Nine of them, the only one we didn't hold was Mashona and East because the, the, the vice president said he wanted to be present for it and he was unwell, so it never took place. But they did come to the Harare one and some went to Manika land and some went to Mashona and Central one. I call them the three challenges. The Nyabadza, Paso Nyabadza, Muruira, Minister Muruira, uh, who, uh, these are people who presented this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these devolution sessions. And the Rukuni, Professor Manrukuni's challenges. The reason I'm leaving there because I think they summarize for me the big the three big issues that devolution has to answer in context of moving towards Vision 2030 for Zimbabwe. The Nyabadza challenge, he called it the hunter skinner cook philosophy. If you translate it into modern, into kind of 20th century management speak, it's about research, produce, process, market, and consume. And his argument was that we have too many cooks. People want to consume. We don't have enough hunters. We have a reasonable number of skinners. And his argument, we need to produce more hunters. We need to put kind of produce not as many, you know, you know, kind of takes some of the cooks to become skinners and take some of the skinners to become hunters so that we can have the strategic, the capability to, to research, produce, process, market, and consume. That was uh, Nyabaza's uh, presentation summary. I called it there, as I summarized it after he presented the experience of uh, agricultural production at uh, the farms and the national economy. Then the Muruira challenge. Magoko. No, it's Muso. It was, what did he call it? He called Musoro, Magoko, Magumbo. Head, hands, and feet. Think with your head. Create with your hands. Implement with your feet. And his argument was that if you're going to develop this economy, we need people who innovate. They think. We want people with the skills to create with their hands. And we need the people with the capabilities and capacities to implement. That I called it the Musoro, Maoko, Magumbo Murira challenge. Then there's the Rukuni challenge. And this challenge was how are we going to avoid the middle income trap? Whereby you grow, where Zimbabwe used to be a middle income country, South Africa is a middle income country, and you stagnate there. Quite often, you actually drop back, fall back to low-income country. And therefore, his argument was that low growth, these are what characterizes income trap, middle, the middle-income trap. You have low growth, low employment, and socioeconomic stagnation. And therefore, you, you, you get stuck there. And that's why uh, my interpretation of it was what he was saying is massification. Produce at the mass level, community level, consume at the community level before you start sending it further up the valley. And that's why I gave the idea of the Gokwe grown cotton, Kadoma woven, Musapa screen printed, locally designed, and made shirt. And that was, I called it my devolution shirt because that, in fact, is the way this shirt came to me. Uh, it came from uh, people who had participated in that chain uh, in terms of economic development. I think I've spoken long enough. I say thank you very much for listening to me. I will relook at the earlier part of the slides. There was some mix up on some of the slides and I will correct it and send it back to the presenters for those of you who should see it. But the real, the one in the, in the booklet is the one that was uh, the original one uh, that is available. I thank you very much. Kevin, over back to you. Kevin, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lene, for that um, insightful presentation. Uh, I now open up the floor for any questions and contributions from the audience. Please use the hand reaction emoji if you've got a question for Dr. Lene or a contribution to make on the topic. Thank you.
any questions or contributions, please use the hand reaction emoji and we'll unmute your mic. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, or contributions? Any questions for Dr. Lene? Uh, Professor Rukuni? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, brilliant. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, even uh, more than I did last time that you presented um, guy which was uh, quite, quite, quite some time ago. But listen, I um, uh, like the comparisons between Zimbabwe, South Africa and Kenya. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the generalization which I used last week from the literature is that the, the colonials uh, left us primarily a two-tier model, that's the national and then local authority. And uh, most of the experiments outside the attempted uh, kind of, um, some say the only real federal state is Nigeria. And then you have South Africa and Ethiopia as kind of quasi-federal. Um, but most African countries appear to be experimenting with how to figure out a third tier. The colonials left us more or less a two tier. Now, how do we figure out a third tier which would improve services delivery and development? How would you respond to that generalization by the scholars? Uh, thank you very much for that, Prof. Uh, any more questions or contributions? Uh, Dr. Lene, would you like to respond to that? Uh, Dr. Lene? Yeah, sorry. I kept trying to unmute myself. I said I'm not allowed to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, Prof, <laughs> the thing about scholarship is about uh, analyzing the past and trying to see where how the past informs the future. But the future is not what defines us where we are going. It might define, it might see how we got where we are, but how we are going to go will get different, defined by ourselves. I, I can see it. You know, the, the federal state in Nigeria uh, and the federal state in Ethiopia, you might say, when you look what are the driving forces, it's very similar to what the British tried to do. There was the Welsh, the English, and the Scots. And basically, those three tribes were having difficulties kind of finding a way to, to, to coexist and therefore creating three devolved states. And of course, the Irish, uh, you end up with four devolved states. Therefore, you, you, you are one nation, but you really have a federal system because uh, the, 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 the warring tribes with their kings in, in olden days could not see themselves coming together from one nation. And, and if you look at Nigeria, it's really driven, and as I said, devolution is driven each country by its own circumstances. In the case of Nigeria, it's really driven by the, the basic ethnic tensions that existed before the British came. They, they, they were, these guys were not in one country. They were, each one of them was a nation state with their own kings and their own systems and their own way they run things. The British put them together and uh, they did what they call, what do they call it? Uh, they called it uh, ruling from London rather than, right? It was indirect rule. Indirect rule in India and, 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 and in, in a country like India and, and uh, Nigeria, and sometimes in Ghana, but Ghana less because the, 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 the ethnic tensions are less. But in the case of Nigeria and, 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 and India, indirect rule left the local chiefs and, 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 and uh, uh, and mandarins and and, 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 and India, the, the China was the same, very much in control of running the affairs, almost like the feudal lords. You, you, run your feudal, you run your feudal state as long as you pay some tithe to the king. Therefore, when independence came, the idea that you're going to create one nation out of a people who, before the British came, even during the British period, 
they had nominal central control, it was pretty difficult. And that I think is the case of Ethiopia, which was Abyssinia before, India with their Maharajas, and uh, Nigeria with their, with their kings and chiefs, uh, the Ogas and et cetera. So from that point of view, they are trying to see how do they evolve a modern state, you know, so-called modern state. And everyone looks at the American system because what they did is they were able to, uh, between the North and South, between slave and, and, and industrial production, they created states that really suited their, their kind of society they were creating. And, and I think a lot of countries around the world look at the US and think, if we could create a similar system, we might become equally economically uh, 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 successful. And unfortunately, or fortunately, China, which had their mandarins, under the Communist Party of China, they basically created a, 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 a devout system with one common language, Mandarin, you might speak your little languages, but you really belong to one central kind of, there's almost like a sense of, you belong to one China, you belong to one country. In Nigeria quite often, and in play Ethiopia, you kind of get a sense people feel that, yeah, Nigeria, the nation is there, but really I'm Yoruba, Ibo, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm Arik. In Kenya, it's very interesting because Kenya with these 45 tribes, uh, the, the wisdom of the people who draft the constitution decided to create 47 counties. And the truth of the matter is that, so a lot of those counties do tend to reflect kind of very close to ethnic boundaries. So they are trying to manage ethnic tensions. In the case of Zimbabwe, really the ethnic tensions are not that compared to many African countries. They are, they are very different. Uh, and therefore, the, their formula was slightly different. It was really negotiated between the, the partners of the inclusive government and, and uh, ZANU and MDC. In Tanzania, which has what, nearly 90 tribes, ethnic groups, Mwalimu decided, no, we want to create one nation and therefore promoted a common language, tried to promote, to promote a common ethos, common philosophy, and is still experimenting in progress. So for most of Africa, I would say that it's work in progress. What is it going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? It will depend on the next generation, this generation is emerging now. How much do they feel ethnic affinity, local affinity, and how much do they feel they are kind of national, regional, global citizens? So I call it work in progress, but the scholars will continue looking at the past, seeing what it tells about who we are, and hopefully use that to predict, to predict the future. I'm very nervous about predicting the future based on where I've come from, you know, you know, because I think the future has to be created. That's my answer to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lene, for that. Um, Dr. Nyoni. Uh, Dr. Nyoni. Dr. Nyoni, are you there? Are you still there? Please uh, unmute. Tech. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yes, we can. We can hear you great. loud and clear. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Kevin. I just wanted to say thanks a lot, Mungai, for a very interesting presentation. It's a, you, you always bring out some of the things that we think are obvious, but uh, you bring them out in a very different light. I was fascinated by the way in which things are supposed to unfold because they remind me what I've just been listening to in the last couple of days. Yesterday, I listened to a discussion about uh, Vision uh, 2030. And somebody said, whose vision is it? Is it the people's vision or is it the center's vision? And then today, I also saw a little quip on the, um, in a WhatsApp chat group says, cows don't give milk. And this is a father giving, you know, advice to his growing up children. And the kids said, but what do you mean cows don't give milk? And uh, what you are saying was that the cow does not give milk, but you have to milk it. So this puts me into the uh, issue that you raised, I think is something like uh, point number eight on the 10 commitments. 
whereby uh, you have to avoid uh, elite capture, but also have a lot of uh, stuff from below demanding these uh, changes. Because what happens is that uh, whenever there's a piece of cake that is put uh, in front of uh, uh, any organization, those nearest to it uh, tend to be the ones that want to grab it. And unfortunately, because the greater populace will not know that there are these things that have been made available. And as such, the issues of capacity building are very central to this whole thing. One can also bring the experiences that we had doing the capacity building programs about 20 years ago. The likes of uh, Andrew Mlalazi, Chatiza would sort of bring this to bear, whereby a pot of money was even given as far down as the local authorities to say, these are for community projects. But uh, the councils per se were rather reluctant to dole out the same thing to communities because they kind of felt, oh no, we've been starved of the, this cake. So we want to use it for the council projects. And so that's why I like this presentation about trying to find ways of uh, avoiding elite capture because that's at the end of the day, is also very true about how to practically implement uh, this devolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nyoni. Any more questions or contributions? Any more questions or contributions before I hand over to Dr. Lene to respond to that? Uh, Philip. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mungai, for the great presentation. My question was, uh, whilst I've seen how relatable the model is to regional comparatives like uh, South Africa and the Nigeria, um, also Kenya, I wanted to understand how these uh, models are, are relatable to in the context of globalizing economies. Say, for example, if look at how uh, African nations or economies are viewed in terms of participation and uh, priority or across the globe in terms of the global economy. I wanted to understand the relationship between these models and how the perceptions of these economies in the global context, as well as uh, the future trends towards uh, each of the models relatable to uh, aspects of uh, where Africa, Africa's trajectory is going, like the free continental trade area, the initiative. In terms of, uh, largely, I wanted to also uh, hear a view of uh, how these economies, maybe they could be doing well now, are they still going to be doing well, say, in the future of globalizing economies? Which models are likely to be sustainable going forward? if economies are to be considered their trajectory in the context of the global economy? Is, are we going to see uh, changes in economies like Zimbabwe, South Africa? Which model could work now or maybe fail in the future or could might not be lucrative now, but could be powerful in terms of like, we're talking about middle income trip, we're talking about things like the arguments between Prof. Morwira and the challenge between you see, that, 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 that's my question. How are these models relatable to the global context uh, in terms of uh, how economies are perceived in the global economy? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for that question. Uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Linne, if you'd like to respond to those. Thanks for the questions and comments. Uh, Dr. Nyoni, thank you very much. And uh, uh, the last speaker, Mr. What is, what is it? 
Yeah, thank you very much for the, for the comment. Um, let me start with the second one, because I think that's a more, more direct question. I think uh, Dr. Nyoni kind of made comments on, 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 on issues that, uh, you know, I can make a comment on it or two. Now, in the, what is the future gonna look like? I don't know, but let's see whether what we learned from the past. In the 18th century, globalization was seen as nation states playing among themselves. It was Europeans fighting for what they called global domination. So uh, globalization was in, if you ask them what globalization, well, the, we the British Empire run a, and we the British run an empire where the sun never sets. And the French would say, of course, globalization is we have huge territories around in Africa. We have countries around the world. The Belgians would say we have one of the biggest country in Africa, which we run. Um, and the Dutch would say we have small countries somewhere in that, in 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin in in uh, Latin America, uh, Central America, where we are running state. So, at the 18th century, globalization was at that level. Then, in the, with industrialization, globalization came to be defined as by multinational corporation, Coca Cola. We are the global country. We are the ones globalizing. Um, Singer, who are producing sewing machines, we are globalizing. Rayland, which was producing trucks from UK, Ford. So the era of globalization then was driven by uh, uh, by, uh, by 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 this multinational national corporations. That was really the first industrial revolution that we started seeing this differentiation that globalization is just about the state. It's about people who play in the state. And by the time we came to the third industrial revolution, the globalization was being driven by these huge tech companies like Microsoft and Apple's and more recently, uh, Amazon's, and of course, now came China. And China is one that is most interesting because what China did is that it kind of uh, took the American model, the American model of uh, 200 years ago, and said the Americans decided to create a regulatory state. In the US, when they went there, they said the state will not invest, the government will not invest, but they will make sure we lay the rules for everyone to play. And that's what they've been trying to promote since then to today, is that the, the states you know, should stay out of business, create rules for the private sector to play. China says, no, we're going to take the Japanese model, whereby the state invests after the Second World War, and they're able to have very quick industrialization of the society. And the Chinese, went one step further. They said, well, we are not just gonna do the state uh, few people investing. We're gonna actually take it to the lowest level. The women and men who make noodles in the village. And this is where Mandirukuni's massification model becomes interesting. They can make noodles be eaten in their village. They improve the quality they sell the next village. They improve quality they sell the... And eventually a Chinese packet of noodle can arrive in Africa and sell for $2. It, and yet, people along the value chain are making money. That basically means they have been able to get to a point whereby to make noodles for a half one billion people or to make for 500 million people is expensive, but to make for an extra 100 million is probably cost a cent. So basically the $1.99 is the value chains. It is the value added by traders, logistics, sellers that are going along the road. So for me, I would argue if I was hypothesizing is that the future of Africa is gonna be the next level of globalization, the citizens. When citizens globalize, what is the fourth industrial revolution gonna do? And that I spent the last five years listening to young people. I am not sure I am a slightly wiser, but not in wiser, but I think Zimbabweans and South Africans and the Kenyans and the Nigerians and the Egyptians can find a way of doing what they are good at. This is a comparative advantage. There is no way a country of 20 million is gonna be labor competitive. When you look at a country like Nigeria with 200 million people, there's no way Zimbabwe will be Nigeria on labor competitiveness in the, in the medium to long term. So what you can do is you're looking at the values that are, you have a comparative advantage to produce because you've got a highly educated population, they are very literate, they can do, they can deal with technology. Therefore, high-end, high-value products can be made in Zimbabwe, and they can be made even in a village. I've seen some of the workmanship by the boys and girls in uh, Seattle. Sometimes you look at it and think this was made in a factory. There are very few countries in Africa 
that you can actually go to their markets and see that kind of quality of work you see in Zimbabwe in the CSO markets. Uh, South Africans, they have a slightly different problem in the sense that they have exhausted their minerals at the moment. They have not been able to build their education systems. Um, the, 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 the redistribution agenda is running into problems in the sense that it is not focusing on production, but actually on redistribution of what the state produces through social grants. So South Africa, I am leaving that to Mwale Timbeki. I listen to him quite a lot of times. He is the one kind of, I feel that maybe he's kind of trying to throw a few light in the corners to understand. South Africa is gonna be a difficult model to predict. But for Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, eh, Angola, DRC, huge natural resources, mineral resources, the world is gonna need them. Figuring out how they can actually use their skilled personnel in the case of Zimbabwe, uh, using their DRC as a big population, 50 or 80 million, I can't remember what they are, they're probably closer to 80 million now. There is a big market there. So creating these internal markets, but really producing from the lowest possible level so that you can increase consumption and you can therefore increase the surplus you sell. I see that's gonna be the way it's gonna go. For me, I think the devolved model is what's gonna work. As long as groups of people, quite often mobilized by the elite, as I always say, I come from Kenya. You say, well, you think because I'm a Kikuyu, the president, I go and I go and eat at the state house? No, I don't. I've never even reached the state house. There are many Kikuyus who would never smell the state house. So the, the idea that because your tribesman is in is the president, uh, therefore you kind of feel that that gives you a special status. It's, it's a misplaced uh, elite, it's actually an elitist concept. For the general population, they remain poor whether they are, they are, they are villager is the president or not the president, or whether their villager is the mayor or not the mayor, whether their villager is the district commissioner or not. So in a way, breaking this down, which is then brings us to what Nyon raised, Dr. Nyon raised. The big problem we're gonna have, and we raised it with the Minister July Moy, we raised it in the provinces, that is that if the structures for people to participate are not set up, people will remain ignorant. And as long as people remain ignorant, those who have the information will continue to use it to their benefit. And those who not without the information and structures to participate will remain poor. Therefore, one of the things we left on the table and we continue raising it whenever we meet with government, but COVID has made it difficult, is that when are we gonna produce the regulations so that they become uh, institutionalized in the alignment of local government act with the constitution so that it is not an option for a local authority to let the citizen know that the, the systems that exist for them to participate and question decisions are in law. If you can get that bit, I think a country like Zimbabwe, I can't say for a lot of other African countries, they got a lot of advantages in his favor, uh, small, wealthy in minerals, wealthy, well-educated, uh, central to the region. So I think in that case, I would, would have to look each country uh, by itself and say, what are the chances? But I think the Zimbabwean chances are pretty good. That's my view of it. I hope I'm not wrong. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lene. Um, Prof. Rukuni. Sure. I, uh, uh, um, uh, was listening, you know, Dr. Mgai, when you said the, the thing about um, almost every African state at the time of independence that to kind of centralize planning, etc., to try and hold the thing together. And then the decongestion and the eventual devolution is something that has happened uh, and now historically as, as that becomes possible. But what, what uh, can you um, do? You, can you give us uh, any clues from the, the countries that you talked about, how they are devolving the planning processes and 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 kind of harmonizing the the subnational plans with the national plans, especially the actual process of planning? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rukuni. Any more questions or contributions? We'll take one more, two more questions, and then we'll let, uh, because of time, we'll let Dr. Lene respond, and then we close off the session. So any more questions or contributions? All 
Uh, any more questions or contributions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, over to you, Dr. Lene. Thanks, Prof. You've asked the, probably the most difficult question of this evening in the sense that the, the devolution in Africa has has been evolutionary rather than revolutionary. That it, is, it isn't driven because the citizens are rose and demanded it. It has a reason because in an evolution way, uh, learning from others, the donors come in and talk about governance. They are told the wonders of America, the, the Chinese. They, so it's not something that came from the bottom people saying, we demand devolution and we demand it because of the following reasons that have economic nature. The, most of them, devolution in Africa has been driven by political issues quite often related to this. So when it comes to the planning bit, because of the way, uh, in my view, the way this pressure for decentralization to concentration has been evolutionary rather than revolutionary, it is left to the central elite to drive the process. So if you go to a place like Kenya, you will find that they are tinkering around with, oh, the, 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 the planners from the Ministry of Planning should be going helping the local, the local authorities, uh, the counties. And the county turns around and says, wait a minute, those are your employees, they're not our employees. Why are you sending them here to come and help us plan? We are quite capable of doing our own planning. All of a sudden, the central government is now pulling back because they're realizing, ah, we thought you could assume this power. The local elite at the county level are saying, no, 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 we have our own enough children. We have enough our own children here. We have local planners. You left us from central government. We can make that the planners. Uh, and therefore, it isn't, it isn't a structured uh, rollout process of how the bureaucracy, which was centralized, is going to play into a devolved system. And Zimbabwe is at that moment. In my discussion with the Public Service Commission uh, at the strategic level uh, earlier this year, my argument was the Public Service Commission is take a deliberate uh, position on how devolution of skills, personnel, systems from a human resources point of view is going to take place. Then put it to the local authorities, have it debated by the elites in these local authorities and the provinces and universities and business people because the business people want to be able to get their services efficiently at the lowest level of government. So they have a stake in this. And if you, might, if you do that, then you are combining an element of evolution with an element of almost like agitation. You are agitating the citizens to say, the constitution says you have the following rights. Do you know how to exercise it? Do you know these are the options for you to exercise it? The question is, is the state willing to do that? Or is gonna say, well, we are done very well. The constitution was passed. We are committed to doing it. And we will slowly implement it as we go along. And as people make demands, then we shall give in and say, okay, then you know, it's part of the, the constitution. And I think in this case, I'm very curious to kind of get an, an, a sense of of all the laws that were in place in 2013, how many have been aligned with the constitution? Because that's not something that, in, that has been a major demand from, except from a very few group of people I talked to. And yet the elite uh, who quite often in the civil society organizations, quite often in business communities who are saying it's ridiculous that you have to go to Harare to get our services. They should have been agitating for saying, there's a constitution, the government is committed to aligning it. When are the laws going to be aligned? We need them aligned and we need to make an input into it. So it really is this question of you cannot, you know, because it's, it didn't arise from the bottom up, it is something that came because the elite were un uncomfortable with some criticism. Some of them were driven by ideology. Some of them were driven by desire to see greater efficiency. Whatever drives the African elite, they have tended to move towards deconcentration and devolution in order to manage a whole series of pressure. Sometimes it's because there's not enough money. 
So you kind of feel if you break it up, people can they, they, people are so busy dealing with their problems. There are no, no time to look at our problems. But I'm not saying that's the case in Zimbabwe. I'm saying, I think in the case of Zimbabwe, there was a very strong political pressure around devolution around the time the constitution was made that people forgot that every province actually there was, there was, there was call for a level of autonomy in terms of the decisions they made. So I would argue that if we are gonna do this, there has to be a combination of a coalition of some people in government, some people in the academia, some people in business, some people in the civil society, some people in community of based organizations coming together to say, okay, how do we get this done? And, and therefore try and formulate a process how that works. If the elites don't take a lead in it, we could be around with the with devolution of paper and not really implement it for a long time. That's my sense of reading it based on what I know Zimbabwe and what I've watched uh, devolution uh, and, and, and de decentralization processes, whether devolution concentration around the world, uh, especially when work with the communities and how little communities know about governments. So they almost feel like they are being done a favor. And yet, if they knew about the constitution, say, no, this is not a favor. You're not doing us a favor. This is our right as citizens. But because they don't have the information, they believe that the civil society are doing them a favor, the NGOs are doing them a favor, the government doing them a favor, development assistance doing them a favor, rather than saying, well, if, if you understand the global SDGs and uh, millennial development goals, and we understand commitment to climate change, and we understand devolution, we understand, oh, they're all talking about us. So we actually have some bargaining power. And that, the African elite, has not quite uh, got that uh, key right, uh, at least understand it. If you look at Asia, there's a lot more in Asian societies where the social movements driven by these more enlightened citizens have actually mobilized the citizens to understand that you have rights. And the most recent one is the when the Indian government tried to change the laws on land. All of a sudden, they discover the citizens, the farmers have enormously very strong voice and they are very clear what they want and what they don't want. And I think that to me, the bottom line would be from academia to people in government is a coalition that tries to make this knowledge available and empower the citizens with that knowledge. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lene, for, for an insightful presentation. Uh, this brings our session to an end. Uh, for those who would like a copy of the presentation, please email, it, email us at admin at dialoguewithprof.com and we'll send you a copy of the presentation. And if you do like our YouTube channel, Dialogue with Prof Mandy, so that you can keep up to date with our posts and presentations. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Lene, for taking time off your busy schedule and uh, sharing your time with us with your presentation. Um, please join us next week for part three of the Devolution series. Uh, we'll be announcing the topic soon. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>